Hey friends and welcome and in this video we'll be looking at the 2020 Integrated Science Paper 1 Specimen. So Grade 9s, this is a 2020 Grade 9 Integrated Science um, Paper 1 Specimen. And let us get into solving this paper. So we, we are given 2 hours 30 minutes in this paper and it carries 80 marks and it comprises of um, sections A and section B. So two sections, that's section A for each question you'll be given four suggested answers, that means it's multiple choice and all you have to do is just choose the best one and show it on the answer grid in the booklet by marking it with a cross and for section B you are asked to write all the answers in the spaces provided and these are short um, short answers that you have to provide. So let's get to section A. So for section A, we have the first question which is saying, which one of the following changes is associated with, which one of the following changes is associated with, um, is, is only associated with puberty in females? Which one of the following changes is only associated with puberty in females? We've got A, breasts grow, B, voice becomes deeper, we've got C, hair grows in the armpits, and D, start having wet dreams. So um, the condition that we've been given is that only, so the keywords are only, The keywords there are only associated with or in females. So when you look at the options that you've been given, you've got breast growth, you've got voice becomes deeper, hair grows in the armpits, and start having wet dreams. So for D, start having wet dreams, this is associated in males. For C, hair grows in the armpits, this is for both males and females. For B, voice becomes deeper is only associated with the males. And therefore, the correct answer is A, which is only associated with the females. So A, the breast grow. You can move on to question number two. The following are the organs in the male reproductive system of human beings with A, penis, urethra, epididymis, and the testes. In which order is the correct sequence of the movements of the semen during ejaculation? So, how does the semen move during um, ejaculation? So, you have to remember to say the penis is, is, is the last part, and the first part should be the testes. And the epididymis is simply a tube through which the semen will pass, and from the testes it goes through the epididymis to the urethra, then the penis. So, our correct answer would therefore have one at the, at the end, two or rather would have four as a first point, then three, then two, then one. And so therefore our correct answer is C. Question number three. Rickets is a nutritional deficiency caused by lack of dash in a diet of a growing child. Rickets is a nutritional deficiency caused by lack of dash in a diet of growing child. So for A, carbohydrates, um, what happens when you don't have carbohydrates? What, what nutritional or what disease can you suffer from if you don't have carbohydrates? Well, if you don't have carbohydrates, you might um, have a condition known as hypoglycemia, which is basically um, you lacking enough carbohydrates in your body. Well, what happens when you don't have proteins? When you don't have proteins in your body, you would have a condition known as kwashoka. And yeah, and what happens if you don't have vitamin A? If you don't have vitamin A, you'd have what is known as night blindness. And when you don't have vitamin D, you'd have, or a child might suffer from Rickets. So rickets is a nutritional deficiency disease caused by the lack of vitamin D. So the answer there is D. We can move on to question number four. 
Which of the following is not an example of ways of preventing pollution of the environment? Which of the following is not an example of ways of pre preventing pollution of the environment? Got A, reducing the use of plastic bottles used in soft, soft drinks industry. Got B, reusing the plastic bags for groceries at the supermarket. Got C, recycling the plastic bags used for soft drinks. And D, barring the plastic bottles used for soft drinks. So which of the following is not? So the keyword there is not. An example of ways of preventing pollution. So, so it simply means three of these options that you've been given are ways of preventing um, pollution, whilst one of them is, a, is not a way of preventing pollution. And if you were to take a wild guess, I believe you and I would agree that the correct answer in this case is D. If you bury plastic bottles, you are not preventing pollution because plastic bottles will not, um, they will not decay or this plastic does not decay and so it will remain plastic for a long time. You, you can throw away plastic for even for 70 years, it will still remain uh, as plastic. You can keep it even for 100 years to still remain as plastic. So the correct answer there is D, which is burying the plastic bottles used for soft drinks. So the best thing that you can do with plastic bottles is recycle them. And let's go to question number five. Question five says, the diagram below shows an animal cell. Identify the parts labeled L, M, and N. L, M, and N. So, rather identify the part labeled N, which is just this part. This part. So we've got L, M, and N. So let's name all the three parts that we have. So what is part L? Part L is part L is known as the cell membrane. Part L is the cell membrane. Remember this? Part L is the cell membrane. And part M. Part M is the nucleus. And lastly, what is part N? Part N is a cytoplasm. So according to the answers that we've been given, the options that we've been given, which one is indicating to say N is a cytoplasm? It is C. So therefore the correct answer for number five is C. We can go on to number six. The term geotropism refers to the movement of a part of a plant in response to the term geotropism refers to the movement of a part of a plant in response to A chemicals, B gravity, C light, D water. A chemicals, B gravity, C light, and D water. So as you may know, plants respond to different um, different environmental factors differently. So they would respond to chemicals differently, they would respond to gravity differently, they would respond to light dif differently, and um, water differently. And the term tropism is simply, simply means response. So um, geotropism is simply the response of plants to geo, geo meaning, geo meaning gravity, right? So whenever you hear the, 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 the term geotropism, you should remember to say it is referring to the movement or the response of a part of a plant to gravity. So the correct answer is gravity. So for chemicals, you'd have chemotropism. For light, you'd have uh, phototropism. And for water, you'd have hydrotropism. So the correct answer is gravity, which is geotropism. And question number seven says, which one of the following is a correct symbol for iron atom? Which one of the following is a correct symbol for iron atom? We've got H, we've got I, we've got Fe, and we've got Al. So according to the periodic table, if you've come across a periodic table, if you know the periodic table, you should know to say H. H is a symbol for hydrogen, right? H is a symbol for hydrogen. Al is a symbol for aluminium.
what does or oh, i is a symbol for which element i is a symbol for iodine and lastly fe is a symbol for iron so the correct answer is c which is fe question number eight a stone of mass 10 kilograms on earth gravity 10 meter per second squared is taken to the moon for an experiment on weight what will be its mass and weight on the moon if the acceleration due to gravity at the moon is 1.6 meters per second squared a stone of mass 10 kilograms on earth gravity 10 meters square 10 meter per second squared is taken to the moon for an experiment on weight what will be its mass and weight on the moon if the acceleration due to gravity at the moon is 1.6 meters per second squared so key thing to remember is mass is always the same mass stays the same everywhere no matter where you take the mass from the mass will always be the same but what differs is the weight the weight changes according to the environment in which it is being taken from okay so the mass on earth and on the moon is the same but the weight on earth and on the moon is different and weight on earth would be found by weight is simply equal to so w being weight is equal to mass times gravity so on earth weight is simply 10 multiplied by the gravity on earth which is 10 and this would give you a hundred so this is the weight on earth and the weight on the moon would be mass which is 10 multiplied by multiplied by the gravity on the moon which is 1.6 okay sorry let me just write that properly so the weight on the moon would be found by the mass which is 10 multiplied by the gravity on the moon which is 1.6 and this would give you 16 so the question is asking you for the mass and weight on the moon so the mass would still be the same it would still be 10 and the weight would then be 16 newtons so we'd have a as our correct answer question number nine a metal object of mass 100 grams was placed in water as shown in the diagram below so you've got water which is at 25 centimeter per cube uh, 25 centimeter cubed and we've got um, a metal object being placed there and after the metal object is placed the level of water increases to 75 centimeter cubed so first question what is this 25 centimeter cubed well this is the volume so the volume of water alone is a 25 centimeter cubed after inserting after placing the uh, metal object in it the volume level increases to 75 centimeter cubed right the question says calculate the volume and density of the metal object used in the experiment so we've got the volume of the water alone and we've got the volume of the water and the metal object so to find the volume of this metal object alone we simply have to say this volume minus that volume so we've got 75 75 75 minus the initial volume was 25 and this would give us 50 centimeter cubed so this is the volume of the metal object alone then density is found by what is the formula for density density equals mass over volume what is our mass our mass is 10 or rather 100 grams our volume is 50 50 centimeter cubed Okay, so 51, 15200, 2. So we'd have 2 grams per centimeter cubed. So our volume is 50, our density is 2. 
which option has got 25 and 2? It's A. So question number 9, the correct answer is A. We'll go on to question number 10. Study the diagram below. Study the diagram showing a metallic bridge constructed over a river. We've got a bridge, we've got a fixed end, we've got a surface, we've got trailers, and you've got water down there, and you've got point P. And the question says, one end of the bridge was fixed, while the other end was not fixed to the surface. You can see there's a gap there, whilst this side, it's fixed. At the point marked P, yeah, so we can see that there's a gap there at the point marked P. This is to allow A, water to pass when the river floods, B, the bridge to, to contract during cold season, C, the bridge to expand due to heat, and D, the rollers to move freely, freely during, contact, during contraction. So why is it that there are rollers there and there's space there? So this is a metallic bridge. And do we know the effect of heat on a metal? What happens when a metal is heated? When a metal is heated, it expands. When it is cooled, it contracts. So temperature, when the temperature increases, positive, it expands. When the temperature drops, negative, it contracts. So if the bridge was to expand, it would have enough space for it to move and expand. Because it is made of metal, it would definitely expand when the, when the temperature rises. So this gap that is left there is left for expansion. So the correct answer is the bridge to expand due to heat, which is C. We can move on to question number 11. Which of the following is the correct function of blood plasma? Which of the following is the correct function of blood plasma? We've got A, it transports water, body waste, and food nutrients. B, prevents backflow of, flow, backflow of blood in the blood vessels. C, adds oxygen to the blood and removes carbon dioxide. And D, fights germs in the blood to prevent diseases. A, transports water, body, body waste and food nutrients. B, prevents backflow of blood in the blood vessels. C, adds oxygen to the blood and removes carbon dioxide. And D, fights germs in the blood to prevent diseases. So, when we talk of fighting germs in the blood to prevent diseases, um, we are simply talking of what fights germs or what, flight, what fights, uh, what protects the body in the blood. We've got the white blood cells, adds oxygen to the blood and removes carbon dioxide. Well, I believe that is a function of the lungs. B, prevents backflow of blood in blood vessels. That's a function of the valves. And the blood plasma is actually there to transport water, body waste, and food nutrients. So the blood plasma is there for transportation in the blood. Okay, so it's a fluid part of the blood and it helps in transporting. So the correct answer for number 11 is A. We can move on to question 12. Question 12 says, the list below shows organs in the, found in the human respiratory system We've got trachea, we've got bronchus, we've got bronchioles, and we've got nostrils. We've got trachea, bronchus, bronchioles, and nostrils. Which of the following is a which of the following sequences is a correct order of passage of air during inhalation? You breathing in. So when you're breathing air, how does it move from your nose up to your your lungs. So does it start from the trachea? Does it start from the bronchus? Does it start from the bronchioles? Or does it start from the nostrils? So when you inhale, you're first using your nostrils. So one. And then it passes through the trachea. So two. And then it goes through 
sorry so as I was saying when you inhale first goes through the nostrils passes through the trachea which is simply a tube like um, part in your body where it will pass through and then it goes to the goes to the bronchus and then lastly we've got the bronchioles so firstly it goes through the nostrils then the trachea then the bronchus then lastly the bronchioles so we've got four one two three so four one two three the correct answer is d and that is the passage of air during inhalation so during you inhaling you first start with the nostrils then the trachea then the bronchus and lastly the bronchioles question number 13 to reduce the spread of hiv and aids one needs voluntary counseling and treatment which is vct which one of the following is not is not the importance of vct a to know one status b to avoid reinfections c to prevent unintended pregnancy d to live positively with one status so what so which of the following is not the importance of vct so the key word there is not so so during vct you'll be taught you will not be taught on how to prevent unintended pregnancy so the correct answer is c and go on to question number 14 study the diagram representing the nitrogen cycle got nitrogen gas we've got plant protein we've got ara we've got animal protein we've got p which chemical compound is found at position marked p and ara in the diagram so we've got p and ara we've got a ammonia b nitrates c sorry a ammonia and nitrates b nitrates and ammonia c nitrates and nitrites and d ammonia and nitrites so in the nitrogen cycle the animal protein from from the animals will be able to get ammonia and this ammonia will then be um, converted will then be transformed to nitrites which will go back into the plant protein so the correct answer therefore is ammonia at p which we're getting from the animal proteins and nitrites at d which is nitrates at ara and the correct answer the correct option is d we can move on to question number 15 which of the following is the correct example of crossbreeding which of the following is a correct example of crossbreeding so when you talk of crossbreeding you're talking of um, breeding two different species okay two different species and bring them together so that you can have a brand new species so let's look at the answers without, that we've been given a self-pollination b breeding within the same family c selective breeding between similar species and d selective breeding across completely different species so cross breeding is completely different species which is d question number 16 which of the following equations best describes the process of photosynthesis so what is photosynthesis process by which plants make their own food right process by which plants make their own food how do they make their own food by mixing water and carbon dioxide so photosynthesis is a process by which plants make their own food by uh, through the reaction of water and carbon dioxide with the help of light and chlorophyll so from that definition we can we can conclude to say the correct answer is d so for photosynthesis we've got this chemical reaction which is water plus carbon dioxide under um, the influence of light and chlorophyll give you glucose and oxygen glucose being the food that the plants need for energy okay 17 study the following chemical reaction between sodium chloride and silver nitrate 
we've got sodium chloride plus silver nitrate gives us silver chloride plus sodium nitrate. One name is given to such a chemical reaction. So we've got sodium chloride, silver nitrate, then silver chloride, sodium nitrate. So if you've noticed, sodium has taken the nitrate from silver, while silver has taken the chloride from sodium. So these two have swapped their, their surnames. We can say surnames. So what name is given to such a chemical rea reaction? So this is a double replacement reaction. So this is replacing that and that is replacing that. So we've got double replacement reaction. Question 18, the diagram below shows the type of lens. So before we even continue, what type of lens is this? This is a diverging lens because the light rays will be something like that. So they are diverging. So this is a diverging lens. If you ever come across a lens that looks something like this, this is a converging lens because you'd have your light rays converging at a certain point there. So this is a diverging lens. Identify the type of lens and explain its use in daily life. So we've got a convex lens, camera, B, convex lens, telescope, C, concave lens, camera, D, concave lens, telescope. So we've agreed to say this is a diverging lens. Now what is the other name of the diverging lens? It's also known as a concave lens. So we know that our answer is either this one or this one. Now where are diverging rays used or where are diverging lenses used? So in cameras, the the, the 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 idea or the concept that is being applied is the concept of converging lenses or converging rays whilst in telescopes we've got the concept of diverging lenses so in telescopes we have a concave lens in cameras we've got a convex lens so therefore the correct answer is d which is concave and it is being used in telescopes. Question 19. Which of the following best, best explains what energy is? Which of the following best describes or explains what energy is? A. Energy is the ability to do work. B. Force. A force used per unit area. C. Ability to provide power. And D. Potential difference between two points in a circuit. A, ability to, to, to do work. B, force used per unit area. C, ability to provide power. And D, potential difference between two points in a circuit. So the correct answer is A, energy is simply the ability to do work. Question number 20. Calculate the pressure exerted on the ground by a metal force, by a metal object on an area of 0 0.5 meters squared if its weight is 200 newtons, so we've got its area being equal to 0 0.5 meters squared and its weight being equal to 200 newtons. And they are asking us to find the pressure. So, Grenines, this is very important for you to know. Pressure equals force over area. Pressure is simply the force over the area. Now, weight is a force. Weight is a force. So we've got our force and we've got our area. So all we have to do is substitute the two in our equation there. We would have 200 divided by our area being 0 0.5. And whenever you have 200 over 0 0.5, should remember to say this is simply the same as 200 over 1 over 2, which is 200 divided by 1 over 2. And this is simply the same as 200 times 2. And this gives us 400 newton meter squared. So the correct answer is B. 
and we are done with section A. We are done with section A. That is how we go about to, um, um, answering questions in section A. This is a specimen from 2020 and we will move on to section B in right about now. Okay, so let's move on to section B of this paper. So for section B, we've got 10 questions and these are short answer questions. We can get into writing and into answering these questions. So the first question is saying, the first question is on the human body and it says study the diagram illustrating the process in sexual reproduction involving gametes which are simply sex cells R and Q. So we've got gamete R, this one, we've got gamete Q and we've got a zygote being formed. So what is gamete R? What is gamete R? Gamete R is the sperm. This is a sperm. Then this is an egg. So this is under reproduction. Identify gamete R. We've identified it to be the sperm. Name the organ that produces gamete Q. Where are the eggs produced? They are produced in the ovaries. So let's just say ovary. And we are done with B. We can go on to see what process occurs between R and Q that results into the zygote. So this plus that, this process of these two, um, these two joining or these two interacting is known as fertilization. So what process occurs between gamete R and Q that results into the zygote? It is fertilization. State the organ in which zygote, in which the zygote is produced. It is produced in the uterus. E, what term is given to the period from the time the zygote is produced to the time of birth? This period is what is known as the gestation, gestation, gestation period. And it usually lasts how many months? It usually lasts how many? Well, that's actually the next question. How long is the period of development from zygote to childbirth in human beings? So how long does it take? from zygote to childbirth in, in, in human beings. How long does it take before a child is born? It takes nine months. So it's usually eight to nine months. But you just say nine months is okay. And we are done with question A. Question one, if you uh, as you've noticed, it was quite a very simple question straightforward, nothing complicated, and we are done with question one. We can move on to question two. So question two is on plants and animals. And here's the question. Study the diagram as study the diagram of a cell as seen under a light microscope. We've got a cell, we've got J We've got K, we've got O, we've got L, we've got M, and we've got N. So let's start by, or let's start with labeling what we have. We've got part J. J is the vacuole. Remember that? K is, K is the cytoplasm. So this, this diagram wasn't really labeled well. And it's really hard to tell which part is which. But from what I am able to see, K is a cytoplasm, all looks like the chloroplast. Because it looks like it's pointing there, though it's really pointing at the same point as K and N. But we'll assume it's pointing at those bigger circles. We've got part L, but L is point in there, which is the inner membrane, so which is the cell membrane. We've 
we've got M, M is another cell, we've got N which is also pointing at the cytoplasm. So identify the type of cell shown in the diagram below. Is this an animal? Is this a plant? What type of cell is it? So it is a plant cell. Why do we say it's a plant cell? Because it's got a vacuole, it's got a regular shape. Remember the regular shape? It's got a regular shape which is five-sided and it's got two membranes which is which 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 are representing the cell membrane and the cell wall. So this is a plant cell. Plant cell. Which labeled features on the cell in the diagram enables you to identify the cell in A above. So we've got the chloroplast and we've got um, we've got the vacuole. So J and O, which are the chloroplast and the vacuole. Chloroplast and vacuole. These have helped us to identify, to say this is a plant cell. States two features on the of the cell labeled in the diagram that are found in both animal and plant cells. So we've got the cell membrane in both the animal and the plant cell and we've got the cytoplasm. So L and N which are cell membrane and and the cytoplasm. Which two letters represent substances which make up the protoplasm? Well, if we look at it again, the protoplasm is simply made up of the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and the cell membrane. So the same answers that we have here will apply here, which are L and N being the cell membrane and the cytoplasm. So as I said, this wasn't really labeled well. So you can say K and N, K and L, K, L, K and L, which will still be the cell membrane and cytoplasm. Or you can say N and L to still be the same. So question two was fairly easy as well. And we can move on to question number three. Question three is on health. The first question is saying, or rather the question is saying the following are examples of nutritional deficiency diseases with marasmus, food kwashoka, and we've got scurvy. So firstly, let's start with knowing what deficiencies or what um, nutritional deficiencies would cause these diseases. So scurvy is caused by so scurvy is caused by um, lack of vitamin C. Vitamin C. Kwashoka is caused by lack of protein. We had established this earlier. Protein. And lastly, marasmus is caused by lack of carbon carbohydrates, lack of carbs. So what shortage of nutrients results in marasmus? So we'd have carbohydrates there. Kwashoka would have proteins. State the symptoms of a person suffering from scurvy and marasmus. So for scurvy, which is a lack of vitamin C, you would have bleeding gums. Um, Okay, let's just write them here. So for scurvy, you'd have bleeding, gums, as well as, and um, poor wound healing. So you'd have sores that would not be healing as quickly as they should. So poor wound healing. Then for marasmus, Person suffering from marasmus would have stunted growth,
and dry skin. What vitamin is needed in a diet to avoid scurvy? Vitamin C, as we have established up there. Explain the importance of children's clinic in relation to preventing nutritional deficiency diseases. So, the importance of children's clinic is that when a child is taken to a clinic, or as we call it here, under five, um, you'd have doctors, you'd have nurses that would be able to examine the child uh, thoroughly and they would be able to advise on what, on what um, nutrients the child needs. So explain the importance of children's clinic in relation to preventing nutritional deficiency diseases. So because of um, children's clinic, these help in quickly quickly identifying lacking nutrients so if they are able to identify to say this child is lacking this nutrient as soon as possible you'd have you'd be actually able to prevent some diseases but if you're not taking a child to the clinic you as a parent might not be able to, to, to quickly identify what nutrients are lacking and therefore you would have a child that is suffering from deficiency diseases. And that's it about question number three. We can go on to question number four. Question four says the diagram below illustrates a model of a tiny particle that form matter. So question four is on materials and energy. What do you call the tiny particles that make up matter? Hmm. what do you call the tiny particles that make up matter and here is an illustration of this tiny particle so what do you call such a particle what do you call such a particle this is known as an atom from the diagram identify the electron and the nucleus so the nucleus is the inner part so this is the nucleus p the electrons are the ones at outside, and these are N. So the, these are electrons, and these are, this is the nucleus. So what is found in the nucleus? In the nucleus, we've got protons and neutrons. And how many electrons does this atom have? It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven atoms. Is it seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes, seven. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. What is a molecule? Well, a molecule is a combination of two or more atoms. Basically, that's that. So a molecule is a combination of two or more atoms chemically combined that is so a molecule is two or more atoms that are chemically combined or a combination of two or more atoms what substance is formed when hydrogen and oxygen are chemically combined hydrogen plus oxygen what do you have you would have h2 O, which is water. So what substance is formed when hydrogen and oxygen are chemically combined, you'd have water. Give an example of a molecule with the same type of atoms. So either hydrogen or oxygen, because these have two atoms, two atoms. So oxygen has two atoms which are forming a molecule so oxygen which is simply O2 and that is that about question this is question number four I believe so question number four was fairly easy as well nothing complicated and we can move on to question number five question five says question five is on materials and energy as well 
and this is electricity no actually this is this is not materials and oh, it is materials and energy and we've got um, light rays being reflected and being refracted and the question says study the diagram of an experiment of light with objects P and Q we've got object P and we've got object Q we've got light coming through there it turns goes out you've got light bouncing off there which of the two objects P or Q is transparent is it P or is it Q I'll say it's P and as a shiny opaque surface it's Q so what do you mean by transparent transparent simply means a substance or an object that is able to allow light to pass through a shiny opaque surface or an opaque surface does not allow light to pass through so p is transparent q is opaque give the reason that helps you identify the transparent object in p in a above so as i said earlier transparent objects allow light to pass through so light is not passing through this object it's simply bouncing off while light is passing through object P so the reason is that P is allowing light to pass through as simple as that to pass through one name is given to the ray labeled T so let's identify T let's look for T T is there so what is happening here is light is coming it bends then it goes out so this bent ray of light is known as the refractive ray it is being refracted so this is the refractive ray angle labeled x x is over there so here light is simply coming there and bouncing back so this bouncing back is known as reflection and this angle x is known as the angle of angle of angle of reflection angle of reflection why does the ray arrow bend as it enters object p why does the ray arrow bend as it enters object P so if you've seen sorry this ray is bending and as it leaves it bends again so the bending of light is due to density so when light is passing through or is uh, transitioning from one object to another and these two objects have different densities there would be a bending of light so it is bending because it is moving from one object of different density to another object of a totally different density. So why does the ray arrow bend as it enters object P? Because of the difference in densities between the two objects. Difference in densities of the two objects so the key word there is density so because of the densities you would have a um, ray bending as it enters or as it leaves an object now here's question number six and question number six is on the human body it says the diagram below shows blood flow in blood vessels labeled R, S, and T in a human body to and from muscles. We've got from the heart going down and we've got to the heart going up. We've got S, we've got R, and we've got T. Identify blood vessels S and R. So blood vessel S is 
an artery. Whilst blood vessels are, are the capillaries. So arteries take blood from the heart to the body, whilst veins take blood from the body to the heart. And capillaries are the connecting uh, blood vessels, and they are really, really small compared to the arteries and the veins. From the diagram, give one reason for identifying blood vessel S in A above. So just from what I've said, what I just said, um, S. Let's let's say arteries take blood. from heart to body. And that is enough information to earn you one mark on this question. Which blood vessel R, S, or T will have a lot of carbon dioxide? So when blood is coming from the heart to the rest of the body, it has a whole lot of energy. It has a whole lot of oxygen rather and very 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 little carbon dioxide and as blood is moving from the body to the heart it has a lot of carbon dioxide and very little oxygen so blood vessel t would definitely have a lot of carbon dioxide would have the most carbon dioxide question d suggest two substances which can be exchanged between blood vessels r and muscle where's blood vessel r blood vessel R is this part. So two things that will be exchanged is or are. Firstly, there's oxygen coming from the heart to be to go into the muscles through blood vessel R. And the carbon dioxide in the muscles will come into the blood vessels through blood vessels R. So we'd have oxygen and carbon dioxide. and you'd earn yourself six marks on this question. Question number seven has to do with the environment. Question A, apart from the nitrogen cycle, name two cycles in the biosphere. So in the biosphere, we would talk of the oxygen cycle as well as the carbon dioxide cycle. What is, question B, what is the importance of the knowledge of the cycles in the biosphere? So if we have knowledge on how oxygen moves, on how carbon dioxide moves, on how um, nitrogen moves, we'll be able to appreciate um, a lot of things that we see around. For example, if we know that um, nitrogen actually comes from animal poo, we'll be able to to appreciate the poo that the animal is, 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 is living there, the dung that the animal is living. And so one of the importance of the knowledge of the cycles of the biosphere is that we'll be able to actually help to regulate, to help us to appreciate and it will help us to balance um, all aspects of the environment. So the importance is regulating helps in regulating, balancing, and appreciating. And appreciating all areas of, the, of our environment. So if you know of if you have knowledge on the on the cycles of the biosphere, you know the importance of keeping enough animals, you know the importance of planting trees, you know the importance of, of having enough water and preserving water and so on and so forth. 
So give one importance of water management. So one importance of water management is that if we are able to manage water effectively and carefully, we would have, everyone would have access to clean and safe water. So if we do not manage water properly, would have would be in a situation where people are actually are actually um, lacking water, which is a necessity. But if we are able to manage water properly, then everyone will be able to access clean and safe water. These are just two ways of effective water management. One by recycling water. Do you know that you can actually Recycle water, recycling water. If you do not know how to recycle water, I would advise you to get your smartphone, to get your laptop, to, to Google, go to Google and just search recycling water and you learn so much on how you can preserve water and how you can manage water effectively. Number two, um, another effective way of water management is Another water management um, way is actually metering water. If people are being know the know the value of water, if people are actually having to uh, being metered and are being made to pay for over using water, then there would be really really good water management because if you do not pay for water you'd actually leave the tap running for days and you don't even care but if you're being told to say if you leave the tap running you're going to be made to pay you'll be able to manage water much more effectively so this is that about question number seven we can move on to question number eight and question number eight is on plants and animals it says the table below shows some examples of plants and animals we've got cattle rhino ch chicken elephant and lion and plants we've got mango orange mokwa sausage and mukola from the table select one animal domesticated by man hmm. which one is domesticated by man we've got cattle And one plant domesticated by man. Which plant is domesticated by man? Let's go with mango. Because you find mangoes in almost um, every compound. And you find keto in almost every village. And it is domesticated. It's, it's not a wild animal. Which animal and plant are in danger of extinction? Is keto in danger of extinction? Well, no, that there's plenty of keto around the world. Is lion in um, danger of extinction? I doubt. Elephant? Uh, maybe. Chicken? Uh, chickens. We have a lot of chickens. But rhinos? Rhinos are actually in great, great danger of extinction. And they're being safeguarded by the world so that we do not run out of rhinos. So, rhinos, for plant, for animals, we've got rhino. So, rhino. And for plant, well, we can say mukula. So, rhino and mukula. For the animal and plant identified in B above, explain why each is in danger of extinction. So the rhino is being poached for it. It's being killed for it. What, what do you think the rhino is being killed for? It's being killed for its ivory. So the ivory is actually um, really, really expensive. And so people are killing rhinos so that they can get ivory from it 
and they would actually sell the, rind, the, the ivory and make a lot of money. And that is what is killing the rhinos. So it's, it's because of the poaching that this animal is being seen as being in danger of extinction. And for Mukula, on the other hand, Mukula is a plant. Mukula, Mukula is being cut down. So killed for ivory, you can say poaching in brackets. And Mukula is being cut down for, for, so Mukula is also a very expensive tree plant. They would actually cut it down and it's got really, really good timber, which is being used in furniture and is being used in buildings and so on. So it's being cut for its timber. It is actually being exported out of Zambia to other countries because it is really, really good timber. So it's because of being cut down or deforestation. So that is that on, the, on this question. And for this, you get the full six marks. Question number nine. What is a chemical reaction? A chemical reaction is... So a chemical reaction is simply a process by which two or more um, substances chemically combine to form a new substance uh, to form a new substance so a chemical reaction is process by which two or more substances combine to form A new, a, a new substance. The following word equation demonstrates the type of chemical reaction. We've got copper plus oxygen to cover copper oxide. What is such a type of reaction called? What is such a type of reaction called? So this is simply this plus that. We are combining these two to form that. So it's simply a combination reaction. Combination reaction. And what type of reaction is the electrolysis of acidified water? This is known as decomposition. Decomposition. reaction it's a decomposition reaction and d explain the following nature of chemical reaction one endothermic so we've got two types of reactions we've got endothermic and exothermic endothermic actually absorb energy or heat as they take place whilst exothermic give out energy or heat as they happen so endothermic reaction are reactions which absorb heat, absorb heat, whilst exothermic reactions are reactions which give out heat. Explain the law of conservation of matter in chemical reactions. So we believe that the amount of matter that you start a reaction with is the same amount of matter that you would end a reaction with even though the the substances have been transformed have been converted into a new substance the same amount of matter that you started a reaction with is the same amount of matter that you would end a reaction with so in the law of conservation of matter the law of conservation of matter is simply a law that states that amount of matter at beginning beginning of reaction 
is equal to is equal to amount at end so that's that about question 9 and lastly question number 10 question number 10 is on materials and energy and we have a circuit there so study the electric circuit diagram below showing resistors connected to cells each having equal voltage so we've got resistors we've got cells and we've got that we've got that we've got an ammeter we've got a voltmeter we've got two amps we've got 10 10 10 ohms so how are the resistors in the circuit connected so these are all connected in a straight line and if they're connected like that this is known as a series connection so they're connected in series calculate the total resistance suffered by the resistors so we'd have 10 plus 10 plus 10 which gives us 30 30 watt ohms calculate the voltage across the three resistors so we know that voltage is equal to current times resistance right so voltage equals what is our current to our resistance 30 and we would have voltage equals 60 volts so we have 60 volts what is the voltage of each cell of each of the cells in the circuit so how many cells do we have we have one two three how do we count the cells tall and short or rather small and big small and big small and big so we have one two three so we have three cells and we have in total 60 volts so 60 divided by 3 gives us 20 so each cell has 20 volts what would be the value of the total voltage across the resistor if the current was 4 amps so again voltage is equal to current times resistance our current is 4 and our resistance is 30 our resistance is still the same 30 our current has been changed to 4 and this will give us 120 volts so therefore the correct answer is 120 volts and that is the last question in this paper and i hope you have learned a thing or two and see you in the next video thanks for watching and remember to subscribe hit the subscribe button and thank you very much